Good morning, friends. Um, this is Sandra Clay. I'm the pastor at Cooks United Methodist Church, and I'm so glad to spend uh, some time this rainy morning. Uh, we It was clear for, not clear, but it was dry for a little while, and so I find myself scrambling trying to get inside the house here. Uh, and so welcome. Um, welcome to those of you who join us um, live uh, practically every morning, like Miss Ruth and Mr. Herman, and there's Jennifer. Um, and welcome to those of you who will be finding us a little bit later. Uh, we want you to know uh, that we hold you in our hearts and we're praying for you already. Uh, we may not know your names, uh, but we know uh, this. Uh, that God loves each one of us more than we could ever imagine. And so, though our circumstances uh, and um, uh, broken dreams, whatever it is that you may be facing in your life, um, is not the definition of who you are, and it is certainly not all that God has for you. And so we pray that you can find God even in the midst of it all. So that's why we've been gathering on uh, Monday through Thursday, 8.30 uh, live stream here on the Cook's Facebook page. Um, and we hope that uh, you might join us. So like us, follow us, uh, subscribe, whatever it is that you need to do uh, to find encouragement uh, on a daily basis. We love you. We love you. Um, because I was running in from outside, uh, there is uh, no um, title right now on the video. And so I'll go back and post that later uh, after, add that later after it uh, posts on uh, Facebook. Um, and so I'll go a little bit slow in case you're writing um, or you can go back and listen later. But I really want us uh, this morning to consider two kiddos uh, side by side uh, because of the similarities uh, in Jesus's interactions with their families, but also uh, the similarities in uh, the rest of their life moving forward. So, uh, we're going to be looking at the experience of Jairus's daughter. Um, we don't even know her name, um, but we know the, about Jairus. Jairus was a synagogue leader, uh, and so you can find this story in uh, several of the Gospels, but we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 8. If you'll remember a couple of days ago, we dealt with the woman who touched uh, Jesus's robe, uh, th that, that was the miracle that happened on the way to the miracle for Jairus and his family. And so we'll be going back to Luke chapter 8, and I'll tell you the verses when we get there. The other story, uh, we don't even know the dad's name, but if you'll remember, uh, there's a, a dad who brings his son. Uh, some would identify, it, scripture often identifies uh, the issue, depending on the translation, as demon possession. Others, though, recognize the effects of that demon, uh, real or figurative, uh, as epilepsy. But a dad brings his son, neither one of them named, and that he's taken first to Jesus' disciples because Jesus is busy. Uh, he is uh, up with Peter, James, and John, um, Elijah, and Moses uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so the hubbub has happened before he even comes down. Uh, so if we will, I want us to go to Jairus' daughter first. Uh, and then I'm going to read the second story uh, about the father and the son, some selected verses, and then we're going to compare those two stories. And remember, uh, the focus is not uh, Jairus, it's not the dad, it's not the disciples, it's not the crowd. Uh, that's a mix of uh, believers, non-believers, and those who hadn't made up their mind. But we have to engage with those folks too before we get to the characters whose stories we hardly ever think about. And that is that precious girl, 12 years old, and, um, and a boy whose age we don't know, but who has 
endured um, for however long, uh, absolute terror in his body and in his mind. So we're going to read first from Luke 8. I'm reading verses 40, 41, 42, and then I'm going to skip down to 49. Uh, so uh, here we go. When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they had been waiting for him. A man named Jairus, who was a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet. He pleaded with Jesus to come to his house because his only daughter, a 12-year-old, was dying. As Jesus moved forward, he faced smothering crowds. Now you know why it was so hard to keep moving and that woman could touch him and others wouldn't suspect that we would ever figure out how. Okay, on to verse 49. While Jesus was still speaking to the woman, he had just said, if you, if you were with us a couple of days ago, he had just said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Well, while Jesus was still speaking, somebody came from the synagogue leader's house saying to Jairus in front of all these people, your daughter has died. Don't bother the teacher any longer. When Jesus heard this, he responded, don't be afraid just keep trusting and she will be healed. Now, scripture doesn't say he was talking directly to Jairus, but it gives us an insight because he is speaking to Jairus about Jairus's attitude. Don't be afraid. Just keep trusting and she will be healed. When he came to the house, he didn't allow anyone to enter with him except Peter, John, and James and the child's father and mother. They were all crying and mourning for her, but Jesus said, don't cry. She's not dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. Taking her hand, Jesus called out, child, get up. Her life returned. She got up at once. He directed them to give her something to eat. <laughs> her parents were beside themselves with joy, but they or he ordered them to tell no one what had happened. Isn't that a curious way for that passage to end? You're not going to have to tell anybody. They think the kid's dead and now she's not dead. If they didn't see the miracle... You're not going to have to tell anybody. They're going to know. I think there's a reason why he says don't tell. So let's engage with uh, the story of the boy with epilepsy. Um, and again, this is from Mark, uh, the ninth chapter. Uh, and we're going to read... Um, oh, um, Okay, so here's the setup. Uh, in Just before we get to verse 20... Uh, the disciples had prayed and uh, were not successful in bringing about restoration and healing for this boy. And so there's an argument going on um, about uh, with, from between legal experts and those who were associated with the synagogue and the disciples. And so uh, here's what the pop said to Jesus. Teacher, I brought my son to you since he has a spirit that doesn't allow him to speak. Whenever it overpowers him, it throws him into a fit. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and stiffens up. So I spoke to your disciples to see if they could throw it out, but they couldn't. Jesus answered them, you faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I put up with you? bring him to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a fit. He fell on the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been going on? He said, since he was a child. It has often thrown him into a fire or into water trying to kill him. If you can do anything, help us, show us compassion. Jesus said to him, if you can do anything, all things are possible for the one who has faith. At that, the boy's father cried out, 
Now, this is before the healing, remember? I have faith, help my lack of faith. You may have heard that in another translation before. I believe, help my unbelief. Noticing that the crowd had kind of surged together, Jesus spoke harshly to the unclean spirit. Mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. After causing the boy to seize, again the spirit came out. The boy seemed to be dead. In fact, several people said that he had died. But Jesus took his hand, lifted him up, and he arose. There doesn't seem to be any closing conversation except later when Jesus spoke to his disciples. How curious that that conversation is not recorded. But let's look at the similarities just for a second. We got two broken-hearted daddies. One who is associated with um, a religious community, a faith community, and is even a leader in that community. And regardless of whether he believes in Jesus uh, or he has questions and he comes out of desperation, we can know that Jairus has seen and heard of all that Jesus has already done for others who needed a miracle. We can assume the same thing about the boy's dad. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have brought, he, he brought the kid to Jesus, couldn't get to Jesus. He started with his disciples. Here's another commonality that we have here in these two stories, besides um, kind of the heartbrokenness and maybe even desperation of the dads. I'm wondering if what led to just one last layer, the straw that breaks the camel's back on top of um, a sense of frustration, helplessness, brokenheartedness, uh, a sense of absolute emergency because of their kiddos. Look at the, look at the, um, the obstacles that make um, even more waiting necessary for these two men. They're on their way to Jairus' house for Jesus to intervene and heal this young girl, and he's stopped by somebody else. I, if, if, I were, if you were Jairus in the crowd watching Jesus have to stop to deal with somebody pressing in on him and touching his robe and Jesus feels the power leave from him, how would you feel about Jesus having to stop and take care of something else first? Hmm. Same thing happened to that other pop. He uh, is looking for Jesus and maybe in a moment of hope thinks, well, maybe the disciples will be able to do something. And now when they can't do something, they're waiting. And in their waiting, Everybody loses it. Everybody blows a gasket and they're arguing with each other about who knows what. About whether it was possible for Jesus to do that. Is it possible for anybody else but God to be able to handle that? There's one more commonality that I want to point out too. In both of these men, we, we assume because he's not given a title uh, and we don't and we aren't told where he came from really that the second father is not a leader uh, in the Hebrew faith he's not connected to the synagogue he's not a legal expert he's just regular old Joe we assume uh, and the and the other guy has standing and power and authority they're on opposite ends of the spectrum so to speak Yet they both refer to Jesus as teacher. They both have a measure of faith, yet now in their brokenheartedness, their frustration, maybe even their desperation, they are struggling to believe that Jesus can do anything. Now here's where the story diverges just a bit. Jairus' uh, response was simply to ask Jesus, would you come? And Jesus recognizes 
when they get the word that she has died, he says to Jairus, keep trusting, keep trusting, she will be healed. Now, we already know, too, that he's healed somebody else. Do you remember the, um, the Syrophoenician woman? We dealt with her on Monday. Jesus healed her daughter, and she wasn't even close by. Now, he is waiting until he gets to that house. Is it because of the character of the need? Or is it because Jairus needs to keep trusting, even as everything comes crushing in on him? Uh, the divergent response for this second pop is this, if you can do anything. Well, before we bust his chops, because we live on this side of the cross, before we bust his chops, let's remember, he's already gotten his hopes up once. He's already, though the scriptures don't say it, my guess is he's already done the same thing that the woman who touched the uh, uh, hem of Jesus' robe did. He spent what money he could. And he's taken his son to what doctors he could or religious experts he could. And nothing has been able to relieve what happens to his son when this demon or this disease rears its ugly head. Here's where another commonality comes and, and turns us toward... Uh, imagining these children or these young people experiencing Jesus. Nobody speaks for them in these stories. Jesus says to Jairus' uh, uh, Jairus wife and the disciples there, don't tell anybody. Okay, we've already addressed that. They're not going to have to tell anybody. But I'm wondering, what story would she tell? Maybe that's what Jesus was getting at. Don't tell anybody. Let her talk about what it was like to go from death to life. Let her tell the story. That would have been so counterculture, and it would have been right up Jesus' alley for a child who is still considered to be property, right at the age of accountability where a uh, culture around her is going to begin looking at her at a potential mate for another person. That's the only value that women had in that culture. And now you've got a young man who is broken in body, broken in spirit. Most people assume that that's because of God's judgment. He ain't got a place in this world either. Nobody's going to be looking for a wife for him. Nobody. And yet Jesus lets these young people who now have a story like very few others, he wants them to tell their story too. Uh, these are the lessons, my friends. We have only our imagination. Uh, can, can I, what would she say about what it's like? Lazarus experienced that to be called out of death back to life. What story could she report? Would it be about lights? Would it be about music? Would it be about who she getting to see God? What does God smell like? What well, I, we we don't know that part, but we can imagine this. We can imagine that sometimes death comes before our bodies give up. Can you imagine the desperation of that little boy? Having a great day, wanting to play uh, Egyptians and Israelites with his buddies on the block. Uh, out and about and running and laughing and all of a sudden, that seizure. Near death. I think some of us understand that, that, that sometimes death comes um, before our bodies die. What story will we tell when God calls us in Christ out of those horrible experiences? What story can we tell my friends, I've told you in the last two and a half weeks now that my conviction about us uh, digging around in these stories and using our imagina uh, imaginations more where scripture is thin on telling the story for us. 
is that the world needs us and we can't tell our stories well if we're not even willing to pay attention to it, if we don't find courage to be able to do that. Um, and, and here's what I would say that uh, once they, th this young man and this young lady have been delivered to life like only the Son of God can, that these are some of the lessons that you and I can take from them. Sometimes traditional religion and faith ain't got anything for us right now. Not the way we've experienced it, lived into it. Um, th there's no word. We have to depend on our own experience with God and allow our faith to deepen and grow that way. Don't blame the church. First of all, it's because we are the church. Sometimes God is taking us to a place where we've never been before. Huh, like this season. And it's easy to get frustrated, isn't it? And frustration will then lead to desperation. Huh, and we can feel like we are at the end of ourselves. But at the end of ourselves is not the same as being at the end of hope. At the end of ourselves, we often find possibilities in God that our imaginations could never have opened up or given us permission to ask for. Uh, another lesson uh, we've already hinted at, and that is sometimes our desperation is based on our own expectations of other people, of God, and we need to hear Jesus speak to us just like he did to Jairus. Keep on trusting. Keep on trusting. She will be healed. Just keep on trusting. Let's watch and see together. Yeah, I, I can't wait. That's one of the, that's one of the folks. These are two of the folks, rather. I'm going to look up whenever we get to heaven, whatever that's going to be like. I'm looking for this boy and this girl. So I want to ask some questions. What was it like? Tell me your story. And while you are imagining what stories they would tell, I will remind us all. The world is waiting for us to tell our stories and not just to let them read it in our actions. My friends, you have been in a place similar to them. I know it. You have been called out of what feels like death and you have dared to trust one more moment with one more step and you have seen or experienced the miraculous. Tell your story. It it's not about convincing anybody that it's the truth. It's about you knowing that it's already true and telling it so that the one ear or the five ears that need to hear it realize they have solidarity too. Yep, I wonder what that boy talked about when the violence left his body and only Jesus could give him peace and he did. How would he describe that peace? How would he describe that sense of strength that he had, had never had before since he was a kid? And what about that young lady? Back to ordinary life, give her something to eat because you know, dealing with death will make you hungry. Tell our stories, my friends. That's what I hear God's word telling us today. Tell your story. Uh, if you're really audacious, and I think that would tickle God. If you're really audacious, how about we pray for God to send somebody our way for us to practice telling what God's done for us. Let me tell you how I experienced the grace of God. Let me tell you about Jesus setting me free. Can I tell you how th that happened to me before? That's as easy as it gets. Take courage, my friends. Let God reveal to you first what your story really is. And then tell somebody else. I can guarantee you it'll change their life. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for um, permission and freedom to be able to dig around in your word and ask questions that won't have answers for a long time. 
it's a delight to imagine what that young lady and that young man would tell could they stand before us and tell their story today. But because our stories are so limit, are so, so um, uh, connected and so familiar, so similar, God, indeed embolden us so that we can ask those questions and find that we're discovering deeper measures of our own stories. And then beyond that, God, Oh, give us courage to tell it. Even if it's just one line at a time, give us the courage we need to own what you have done for us as a way of enriching that gift yet again, but also setting somebody else free. You intended that we would be connected with one another. You created us in community. You created us for community. And we must let these stories, even when we don't know all the details, remind us of who and whose we are. So I pray for those who hear my voice today, that they would hear your voice, oh God, say, keep trusting, keep trusting, it's coming, it's coming. And I pray that the people who hear my voice today, will feel you take them by the hand and raise them up out of their circumstances. Circumstances that feel like, smell like, are death drenched. That we might walk into life, new life in Christ together. And with that hope and courage and freedom, tell our story why we can do that, how we can do that, so the world will be invited to keep on trusting, keep trusting, I believe, but God help me help all of us with the places where we don't believe yet, for you are there too. Oh, thank you God for the strength and courage and freedom that is still unfolding in us. Help us to live by you and for you. In the name of Christ, who gives us his life, we pray. Amen. My friends, I'm so glad to be with you. Let me tell you this. Uh, I had a thought run through my mind as we were praying. And so I'm going to go back and attach in, this, in the comment section uh, the scripture passages so that you'll have those. I'm also going to share... Um, I'll figure out somehow, but there is a song by the Tallies uh, called The Promise, and it is a, kind of an imagination of what Jairus' family and their neighbors and friends would have imagined uh, had, Jesus, had they seen Jesus show up or when they saw Jesus show up. And so I hope that you'll find, try to find that on our page or look that up uh, on a, a streaming um uh, a streaming opportunity for you, the tallies, and the name of the song is The Promise. That promise is coming for you. Thanks be to God. See you soon.